Here we go. Three, two, one. All right, here we are. Welcome, uh, welcome everybody. I'm Don Sawyer. I'll be your speaker today. Uh, and we are going to be talking about a very exciting topic, which is fundamentals of test driven data engineering. And I have prepared some live demos and examples with DBT and Python as well. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first things first, how is this talk going to go? And I, I think this is important so that you understand kind of where we're going to flow because there's a little bit of warm up to get to the demos, the exciting DBT and Python stuff. So I'm going to lay a little emotional and intellectual groundwork and you'll see what that means in a little bit. Then I'll define the use case that's used in the examples because anytime we're working with analytical data helps to frame up the the uh, use case. Then we'll do the walkthroughs and then assuming there's time, I'll be checking my time check. I'm going to actually do test driven development live for you uh, using these tools, uh, at least one of them. So hopefully that doesn't crash and burn, but no, we'll be fine. Uh, but I really want to show what it looks like to actually add a feature using test driven development. And then we'll have some closing thoughts around um, what should you expect? What do you want? What might you run into? But realistically, the whole point here is I want you to have the foundational knowledge to walk away from here, not necessarily knowing how to do this in Python or DBT, but to be able to know what the expectations are when you try to do this on your own because you're not going to it's not going to be a walk in the park. So I want you to be prepared for that as well. So let's start out by quick introduction about myself. I am the director of data engineering and improving Twin Cities. I've been a software engineer, architect manager, whatever you want to call it for 20 years, and I've been working in distributed data, Hadoop, Spark, Snowflake, Databricks, those types of things for the last uh, a little over seven years. I'm a retired adjunct instructor and uh, I just retired this year, but I built a class for the University of Minnesota called Big Data Engineering and Architecture, which focused on how to do things right in data engineering, not just the concepts. And that's something that's really important to me as I had gone through my undergrad, I, I tried to do things better. But when I went through software engineering, when I got my software engineering masters, that's when I really started focusing on doing things the right way in data science and engineering and all of my grad research, specifically around testing and agile were around data science and engineering. I really love software testing. I love agile done well with that agile mindset. And in, you know, in turn, I also love mentoring teams to be able to do that. That's why I give this talk and that's why I give talks very similar to it uh, with agile as well. All right, so I'm going to start with the emotional groundwork. What I want to talk about here, is just some of the problems that frame up. Why is this topic really important and why should it be really important for organizations? And maybe now is the time to start having this conversation so you can start to turn that ship. The first of these items is that data is inherently messy. We understand that. We all know that our data is a mess. Uh, it has problems and maybe it is really clean data, but it has nuances in it that make it difficult to work with. But what that means to me is if we have a more complicated technology, and in fact, data is also probably one of our most valuable assets, shouldn't we be taking more care to verify its quality? And so that's something that's really important to me, and that's going to be a big part of the testing. So I want you to think about something. And this is this is one of the things that hit home to me a number of years ago where I said we have to make a change. Uh, so think of the which of these two responses matches your situation. Someone comes to your manager or you or your director and uh, they say, hey, the data in the report is wrong or there's something wrong with the data or there's data missing and they explain it to your manager. And your manager does one of two things. Your manager does, OK, we're going to they're going to throw you. They throw you under the bus. They say we're going to find the issue right away. This is horrible, you know, and then they send you an email to start troubleshooting the data issue. And then there's number two. The managers with confidence can say, I really don't think that's an issue that came from our data pipelines. We have tests and here are ones that maybe they'll be able to point to those tests, but I'm going to talk to our team and let's make sure we can verify this so we can help you find the issue. Those are two very different responses. And what I found in my career up until I started really getting into the test driven development portion and even working with clients now 
it's usually the response number one. And as a developer, there's nothing more um, there's nothing more depressing than when our manager can't trust us and our users can't trust us. So I work, I, I would say work really hard on the testing part so that you can actually have that conversation with your clients and your business users and be able to say, no, we feel like this is pretty good, but we can help you find the issue because we have the test to help you find it. And I think that's a really good point when it comes to testing for me. I like that confidence and I like to be able to build that trust with my users. A couple of other problems that I often see and, they, and this relates to things that we can work between agile and testing that can help us get there. Deployments being manual comes up a lot. Uh, I don't enjoy babysitting jobs, and so I would prefer if a machine can do this for me so that I can go have lunch or, you know, go do something that I want to do on the weekends. Um, oftentimes, uh, requirements are missing or incomplete. Now, this might not sound like a testing problem, but when it comes to test-driven development and automated testing, requirements are the t first thing where we can actually get those tests from. They define what we need from the data, what is expected of the data in the different data situations. And I'll go through some data situations later. And the other one is just the oversimplification of story writing. And this one, it, it's not as related, but if you get good at a good development process, this becomes easier. But it's answering that question that often comes up, which is why aren't we progressing faster to production? Why can't, why isn't this done yet? And we tend to oversimplify what it takes to build a data product. And if we can actually have the automated test and be really good at the story writing process and build that culture, we get really good at being able to answer how long will this take. All right, so here's my philosophy that comes up almost every day, at least every week, and it's something that I speak about a lot, which is testing is hard, but one test is better than no tests always. And what I mean by that is it's important that you can at least build your first test. You don't have to have a fully tested application. I would prefer if you did, but if you build your first test, this is gonna help you prove out uh, a couple of things. It builds out your infrastructure for testing so that when you do have a little bit more human capital, you can actually write some more tests and start filling out that test suite. The other part is, is the automated testing and data engineering is incredibly difficult. And so this allows you with that first test, allows you to figure out how will I test this? What, what types of data artifacts do I need? What tools will I need? And what infrastructure do I need? You don't want to do this once you've had, once you've written 10,000 lines of SQL or other types of ETL code. That's going to be a very difficult time because you probably also at that point have a monolith. What this helps you to do is it helps you keep your, keep your system uh, small and hopefully decoupled so that it's easier to test. In addition, writing that first test right up front or writing at least one test is easy, is better because it means your requirements are fresh, you fully understand them, and so you know how to fully test it. And then, of course, what I always say is uh, when I work with my kids, we always talk about a penny saved is a penny earned. If I write one test now, that's one less test that I have to write later. So this is a really important concept for me. All right, so why is the automation of our unit testing or our testing so important? Um, well, I find with working with a lot of clients that automated unit testing or testing um, or any testing actually, but really the automated part is almost non-existent, um, especially in data pipelines. And this is a problem for me and, and, and I hope it's a problem for you, but I'm hoping that now you can go away and articulate that. And number one is you have unknown data quality and correctness. We all want to talk, we all want to trust our data and we want to be able to make decisions, but we can't have swings of our sales estimates by millions of dollars uh, every other hour. So you need that data quality. We don't have known code, our code that's running our pipelines. We don't know the quality of those. Uh, we don't know the impacts. If we're not testing, we're not going to know the impacts of when we need to make a data structure change, like a table, adding a column to a table or maybe updating a bunch of data because a calculation was wrong, we found a bug. How do we know that that change was implemented correctly? Not having the ability to write automated tests and not doing that is not gonna give us that quantifiable quality. The other thing that testing does is when an issue does arise, we can actually add those test cases to our test suite and start figuring out what test was missed and where did this fail within our pipeline? 
and that will actually help us to identify what went wrong. I don't know if you've, for many of you, if you've had to support a data pipeline before, but sometimes when an issue happens in the middle of a large data pipeline, it can take uh, many hours and sometimes a day or two to find where that issue actually occurred. And that's really complex. All right, moving along here. Let's talk about TDDE then. So first, um, we're gonna, I'm going to help you to think about TDDE because I want you to reframe your mindset around TDD. And I'm going to just introduce TDD real quickly, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about reshaping your mind so that we can get into these use cases. All right, so of course, test-driven development. If, you, if you've not encountered this, um, definitely go and do some research on it. It's really fantastic, but I'll give you the, I'll give you the quick primer. Um, but the reason I like it is because my favorite way to start testing is to start with testing. So test first. So what you do is you actually write your tests. So you write a bunch of tests and then you run those tests. Now, if your test passes, it means you wrote some bad tests because you haven't written any code yet. So you need to rewrite your tests to make sure they fail. Now, if your test fails, that's good at this point. So you start writing code so that you can satisfy the test. These tests come from your requirements and then you run your tests again. If they fail, then you continue writing code until the tests pass. And then you, once all the tests pass, then you know that your that your code's good. So then you clean or you refactor the rest of your code, um, and you make sure that it follows design patterns and things like that. And then you run your tests again. If they fail, then you fix the refactor until the tests all pass again. You go through that cycle. But if they do all pass, then you move on to the next feature and you write the test for the next feature. Why do we do this? I won't go through all the examples because the theory of this goes a long way, but what's important is it really easily integrates with Agile. You use your acceptance criteria to help you write the tests. Um, it makes feature completion a lot easier because once you have the test and you've defined how it's supposed to look, you don't have to guess if your code's working. The test harness is telling you that it's working or it's not. Um, what's, ex what's also nice is um, you can actually use TDD even if you have existing features, you don't have to start on a Greenfield project. I like TDD because I can start doing TDD any point in my project. I prefer it to start, but you can actually pick it up at any time. All right, so that's, another, that's a quick perimeter that we got through. So why is test-driven data engineering different? Well, as many of you probably know, not every pipeline or DAG is code. Stream sets, NiFi, Talon, Alteryx, all these different tools that have UI-based uh, functionality, they don't have uh, code that you can test against. Now, you, there are some ways against that, uh, ways around that, but and I'll cover that a little bit later. Um, you'll need to reimagine what tests you will need to run. A lot of times when we're doing TDD, you're running unit tests. Now, you can either redefine what a unit test means to you in this scenario, or you can just say, I'm, I'm doing TDD as integration tests because data is, an, is actually just, it's an exercise in integration. So they're really technically integration tests. Uh, but there are some pieces of your pipeline, if you're writing Spark, for example, that you can use true TDD at a unit level. And then data engineering, oh, I kind of covered that. So the other problem or difference is that SQL itself doesn't have JUnit, it doesn't have PyTest, it doesn't have RU, it doesn't have all these different test suites. In fact, the first, one of the, the current project that I'm on, we started, by writing SQL tests, which was really hard. Now, we, we you can do it. It was very difficult, though. It is doable. Um, but then you're going to have to change your understanding of some testing concepts that I'm going to go through now. All right, so let's start here. One of the things that I, I really want to impart on you is that we have to take a step back and think about the abstractions when it comes to the systems that we're working on. We can't get stuck on the definitions of things. People like to be consternate over the definitions of a unit or a test or data or inputs and outputs. Forget about all that. Let's go back to the beginning. But in order to solve the testing problem, which you will need to use significant amount of problem solving because you're not going to have everything. You're not going to have an easy button. And so, um, so we're going to fall back on problem solving. So let me just explain what problem solving is. You start with, what are my expected outputs? Those are my ex acceptance criteria. What are my required inputs? And then in data, you have to go, what are my available inputs? 
And so, and then you're going to try to figure out how do I get from my available to my to my um, to my output. And what I'm saying here is this problem solving process might be applied to I need to be able to write a test, but I don't have a test harness. I don't have the ability to do this. So the output might be a test that runs it automatically. The inputs might be I have Python code and you have to figure out how to make those two things work. And you're going to develop a software system that helps you to do this automated testing. So what is a test? So typically, you know, it's a function. No, it's not a script that you run. It's if you step back, it's a verification activity that determines if a system under test produces your expected output with your input. And what this, the reason you have to redefine this is, is you can call it a verification activity. You don't have to tie it to Python. You don't have to tie it to Go. You don't have to tie it to Scala. You don't have to tie it to anything specific. You just say, I need to do, I need a verification tool. And that's fine. You can draw the concept of the algorithm first, and then you fill in the boxes of what is that verif verification activity then? I can start designing that part of the software system. And then what is data? This sounds really silly, but I, I'm not gonna lie. I've seen a lot of times where people get hung up on, I need to use this table and I've already got that table and I can't, I, so I'm gonna insert data into a live table. You don't have to do that. Think of your data as a destination or a source. And what I'm saying there is, if you can actually write a generic version of it, like I have here, where everything is configurable, you can actually choose the location, you can choose the name. This allows you to actually be very flexible with where your data goes and where it comes from. And you're, you're gonna see this in my examples. And then uh, lastly here is the anatomy of a data test. If you look at this, if you've done automated testing before, you may see something familiar. Given, when, then. This is the anatomy of an automated test or a unit test. Given some state, when I execute some code, then this should be true. And so in data, this is the same. In the setup, you're setting up objects. Um, you're getting inputs as parameters. That doesn't change here. What you're going to do as the setup is for your inputs and the state of your system, you're going to insert data into the source system. Then when you execute your SQL or your ETL or whatever step in your, I, I like to do it as my pipelines as steps. I actually write the test that way. I'm going to select from the source. I'm going to perform my transformations and then I'm going to output to some destination. Now the source and destination could be two different tables in the same database. They could be different tables and different databases. They could be the same table in the same database. Doesn't really matter. But if it's configured, it really doesn't matter if it's configurable. This is something that I preach a lot is the configuration of your system. But if you just think about these as generic concepts, I can fill in what setup, execute, verify our destination source when I actually need to write my code. And I'll show you that in a second as well. But then the verification is. I need something, a so piece of software. So each of these boxes is a piece of software that selects from the destination, performs some verification, and uh, and then and then uh, tells me if I passed or failed. Sorry, it looks like I missed a half a sentence there. Can't win them all. All right, so let's talk about our use case and then let's jump in. So we're going to use some flight performance data. All right, now. Any data product needs to start with a business question. If you don't have a business question, you don't have requirements. Uh, what also happens is if you have really good business questions and analytical questions, this allows me to map my source systems to what needs to be in my destination. Instead of just selecting all columns or columns that I think are necessary, I can actually select only the columns that I need. And I've kind of bolded the things that point to columns that I'm going to need as a part of my system. So basically what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be looking for flights and figure out did they arrive at their destination or not. I've got some input data. I've got on time data, which is the flight performance, and then I've got a lookup table called carrier code where we will then join on the carrier to the code on on these two tables, select some columns from both of them and turn those into on time D norms. So this is what we're going to test. This is our ELT process here is going to generate this on time D norm. That's what we're going to write, do some TDD on. 
So the first thing we have to do is write our test cases. So what are test cases? Test cases are just data. OK, so I'm going to have inputs. Carrier code, in this case, I'm using made up data. I made up the data, that's my input. And this is what you should be doing. A lot of people are, feel very inclined to use true production data. And that's OK too. I mean, to be honest, if you can get to one test with product, if, and that means you have to use production data, fine. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but the, ideally, what I like to do is make it up because you can see here, I'm typically using numbers that represent, oh, all these are have one in them. That probably means that it's test case number one. That's usually the case. Now, I didn't follow, I didn't follow that pattern completely throughout this, but it, that's one of the things that I do is I use the number one or I use something that indicates which test case I'm using. So here you can see I'm expecting I'll join A01 to A01 on the flight data. And if you look at the output, I didn't select everything from the flight data, only the things that answered those business questions. So I need to verify that only these columns exist. And I really should be ver I've calculated what all these values should be in here. But in the case for the join, I'm really mainly validating that this join worked and these are the values that I got in my on time denorm table. Next test case. I got some carrier codes. I'm hoping none of these will match. So I'm going to use the same record from the last one. And when I join, I should get the value of unknown. So this was one of the requirements. So instead of, so this, what this is pointing to is I need a test that makes sure that it does, that it adds a, uh, it still adds the row. It doesn't drop the row. I can't tell you how many times I've run into this where we didn't have tests in an ELT pipeline. Somebody put a join in instead of a left join or a left join instead of a join, and we had unexpected data in our tables. And so this allows you to catch that and verify. We have talked about, we have discussed what are the requirements around the join. And I think that's a really good conversation to have. It gets the entire team collaborating so that you are all on the same page of building this product together instead of just handing it off to the product owner, you know, four or five weeks after they've asked you to do the story. Next test case. Whoops, forgot to highlight it, but uh, well, I thought I had highlighted it, but both of, uh, we should have one match and one not match. A01 here and should match A01 and A02, and we should have A02 should not have a match. And you can see here, we're expecting this. And so I built these test cases in CSV files for the projects. Uh, for the examples, and so we can we'll take a quick look at what one of those looks like. And then the last set of test cases. So those last three test cases were OK, I'm testing. Test case one was where the join worked. Test case two was where the joint didn't work. Test case three was where I had a set of data where I had some joins that worked and some that did not. Those were individual test cases that I separated out as separate data inserts and separate data verifications. Now for the arrival flag, so I'm going to add a column called arrival flag. This is going to help me calculate that percentage uh, that arrived and the arrival performance. Well, this one I'm going to do as instead of three separate cases, I've got eight test cases. I'm going to put them all in the same test data. I, I shortened, I, I, I uh, narrowed the table in this slide. I mean, it's just so that we can see what I what I have in here. But I've got sort of, you can kind of see how I set up the data. A01 is arrived airline. So these are test cases where the flight arrived. A02, these, these test cases are when the flight didn't arrive. And A03 are, I'm not sure if the air, aircraft arrived or not. And so on the input on time uh, metrics, you can see the first one is blue, A01. And so based on these three values, these should calculate to an arrival. The ones in yellow, where I have an arrival delay or not an arrival delay. And then of course I've iterated through the values for canceled and diverted and use those as part of the calculation. And the last one is where arrival delay is null. So I don't know if it arrived. I don't, and it says that it wasn't canceled or diverted, but I don't know what its delay was. I'm not sure. And of course the expected outputs that I would have are yes, it arrived, no, it didn't, and no. All right, so those are our test cases. So let's get into the let's get into the good stuff. I think I'm about right on time, so this is good. Um, let's get into this. So the way this environment is set up at this point is I actually am doing this with SQL Server. Now you don't have to use SQL Server. It doesn't have to be something with SQL Server. 
this is this even to be something in Docker. It doesn't matter. It's the destination. The destination I chose here was SQL Server Docker because now I can do my development locally. So what I have is, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and kill my Docker container. I have a Docker container, which I can just spin up on my machine. And actually what it's doing in, the, in, in Docker is it's spinning up the SQL Server database and it's setting it up. It's creating the databases for me. Uh, I've, I've got in source control, I've got how to create the databases, I've got scripts to do that. And I can actually verify that this thing exists by connecting to it and saying like use dev and go. And you can see that I have a dev database. Um, I'll, let me bring this up just a tidge for you. There we go. Um, and I can do something like select star from on time data. And you'll see there's no, there's no data in there, but my tables are in there. So that's good. So I've set up my database as, as I'd like to so that I can use it. All right, back to here. So that's, and oh, let's uh, take a look at Docker here. And all this is, is you can look at the Docker Compose, but it's just pulling SQL Server. Um, so when I do Docker Compose, it's doing this, and then it's initializing the SQL Server. So to initialize the SQL Server, it's setting up the databases. I've got the two source, source tables. I'm creating a store. I have a store procedure that I'm going to use. Um, and it's done this for both prod and dev. So you can see here I've actually created, I use parameters to create those. All right, so that's set an in-memory Docker container with SQL Server. All right, so that's good. All right, so the setup, the given. This in the Python and SQL Server, in this Python and SQL perspective, this uses PyTest, and this is using PyTest configs. So in PyTest, I can use things called fixtures. So let's take a look at how Python is setting this up. All right, so let's see, actually, I think I might have closed down something that I needed here in PyTest. I need comp test. My apologies, here it is. Okay. I have in here session start. So what every time that I run PyTest at session start, it's actually going to initialize the databases. Um, assuming hopefully um, every time I've done testing, I'm clearing them out. Now I could also set this up to delete everything or I could even have it tear down the Docker container and restart it, whatever you wanna do. But in this case, I'm just making sure that the databases are set up. And then when each test is run, I've got a, an object called MS SQL con. So anything that needs to connect to SQL Server, we'll just reference this and I have a connection to the SQL Server based on my configuration. All right, and then I already showed you the initialize, so we're not gonna, we're not gonna look at that again. All right, so that's the setup. So that's the given. Okay, so when, so when I execute a stored procedure, so how do I execute the stored procedure? Well, it's going to use a test function in PyTest. All right, so in PyTest, so let's go to the, first let's go to, I want it to execute this stored procedure, which is a create table, um, insert into you know the denorm table by, with a select, et cetera. Well, let's start with a test function. In Python, what happens here is um, it, for every function that starts with test underscore, it will run this as a part of the test suite. Okay, so let's look at this. Couple of things. Inserting the data. So what I said was in the when or in the setup part, I need to insert some data. Okay, so I've, I've created, we've created this data manager. And what I can say is, hey, tell it what the name of the object is and, and what, it's, what it's gonna point to, and it'll grab the CSV file. These CSV files are used for both the DBT and the Python portion. So they're, they're exactly the same. So what it's going to do is going to use data manager to do all of the inserts. And so it's going to insert on time data and carrier code data. So we can just take a look at one for when we're doing uh, test flight canceled. Um, let's see, we want uh, join OK. And join OK data is right here. OK, so it's going to insert carrier code. There's a carrier code data, pretty straightforward. On time data, pretty straightforward. 
Okay, same as what I showed you before. But then we're also going to be comparing it to some expected data. All right, so what this is going to do is this going to insert those CSV files. But one thing that you'll notice is this other PyTest fixture. It, this fixture is being run automatically before each test, which is resetting the data. So it's going to go ahead and um, set up the data, and then it's going to go ahead and uh, after the test, it's going to come back to this yield, and it's going to refresh the tables and reset them so that every test starts with a clean set of tables. This is really important because you don't want any lingering side effects if you accidentally leave some data around. And I have four tests here. I have, um, so this is the join is okay. This is if the join is unknown, the combined, and then the arrived flag. All right. So, oh yeah, I got to execute the store procedure. I only set it up and then, I need to execute store procedure. So I have a test manager. We have a test manager function. Um, I won't go through those, but basically we've created um, a Python framework that has special functions that help us do these very easily. But basically what I'm doing is it's executing the store procedure that I give it, and then we'll figure out and verify if that worked after the fact. Okay, so now we've done the execute. Now we need to verify. So part of the verification is I need to compare an expected value to an actual value. The expected value is built in a data frame. Now there's two ways that you can do this. Uh, that you know typically, oh, there's actually three. You could run a SQL command that selects data um, from a, you know a code or, or a, a core or repository that has expected data. You could do a CSV file, which I'll do in DBT, or you could do this. I prefer to do this because it means that as I'm writing the test, the, the expected values are sitting right in the function where I'm running the tests. So you can see here, I'm going to compare uh, the actual results to this data frame. Now, comparing data frames in Python is actually very annoying because how it does data types and nones and nulls and all sorts of other things that come up which is actually why we built the SQL test manager and other tools that allow us to compare data frames. In fact, uh, one of the problems that we have is if two data frames, when you compare the two don't match, it just says that they don't match. And you're like, okay, well, there's hundreds of columns and thousands of rows, what didn't match? Um, and so what, what, uh, what we built in, when we did this, we're like, okay, well then we need to build a tool as a part of this framework that compares and tells us, was it a column missing? Were the columns out of order? Were they named wrong? Were there not in the same number of rows? Or which value was wrong as a part of this comparison? And so we actually wrote tools, we write tools that tell us exactly what went wrong. Yeah, that's a big job. I wish something would just tell us that and have and be available for us. Now we might be able to use something like great expectations, uh, but in this case, we didn't have it, we didn't have that luxury. So we wrote, built it ourselves. And then at the end, so we're going to go ahead and um, select the data uh, and compare whatever the actual, we just say assert that these two, that the data frames are equal, the actual versus the expected. That's the anatomy of a test, given then when. So that's the Python part. I suppose we could probably, I suppose we could run this. Should we, let's look at what this would look like in test driven development. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just going to go ahead and I'm just going to comment out. I'm going to just zoom out for a second to make this easier for me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just comment out code. If I were to run this, for example, uh oh, I needed to kill my Docker container. Nope, we did something wrong on this one. Yep, I got to kill Docker. Thought I did this one before. That's always good. It's always got to be a mistake. We'll come back to that. So when I run this, uh, I've got a test configuration. PyCharm, for example, has this set up for me, um, but I, I set up all the configurations, but I can actually have a configure Py test for me. And over on the left hand side here, you can see that if the test passed or not. And that's that's pretty useful. I'll come back when we do the live one and I'll, I'll, I'll break the test and come back to it so we can actually see TDD here. But for now, let's move on to DBT. 
So DBT, if you're not familiar with it, this isn't, I'm not going to go into the depths because it's going to take me three hours to go over what DBT is. But basically what DBT allows you to do is configuration-based transformations. It's, e it's part of an ELT process. I'm going to run the transformations. It's going to do a whole bunch of verifications, but it's very configuration-based. It's super easy, super helpful, and provides easy access to tests. Not necessarily unit tests, but definitely makes it easy for data quality tests. So we're going to set up the DBT part by using dbt seed. Okay, so what is dbt seed? So let's start with what, what this is gonna look like. Um, let's see, I need to find my test script here. All right, so this is my actual script and I scripted this so that it's easier for me to run them all together, but I'm doing a dbt seed. So I say dbt seed, and the way that I've set this up is I've said, hey, I've tagged the different test suites that I, all the different test suites uh, that I want to run. So I want to run the join OK test. So I've tagged a specific seed within the model, and I'm targeting the dev database, which will then go to Docker. All right, so that's the seed. That's the command for, it's that easy to seed the data, to do the insert. So in Python, I had to go through this whole rigmarole. But there was some rigmarole in, in DBT. So in setting up a DBT project, it's very configuration based. So you'll see a lot of YAML. I'm going to scroll down. I hate, I know it's sorry to scroll during a presentation. Well, let's just look at the join OK. So I've got inside the join OK portion of the model, the those set of tests, I've got the on time data, the carrier code data, and I've got the expected data. So I've set up these three seeds. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to insert. Um, but I've given them each a schema. And this is because DBT doesn't allow you to model the same, the same artifacts to the same schema, database, and table name. And so I'm saying, okay, then for the test ones, I'm gonna use for test case one, I'm using this schema and I'll clean that up when I'm done. And so it'll insert, it'll create on time, on time data, carrier code, and then it's gonna create a destination table um, called I didn't use an alias, so the table that it's actually going to put the expected data in is going to be called 01 on time denorm join OK expected. OK, so a, that's going to be the name of the table. That's how I can figure this. I did this for each table for each test case. This was very, very, uh, let's just say tedious. All right, so let's move to what else I configured to make the seed work. Inside this file within my data, there's a data directory. I've got a unit seeds.yaml. And there's other configurations that I need to configure about the seeds that I couldn't configure in the main DBT project. So, and that was which tests are going to be run for each table. So for the join OK table, uh, I, what I wanted to do is I have a library call, that I downloaded called DBT Utils, which is really fantastic. And what it has is it has a comparator, an equality comparator that'll compare one table in exactly to another table. And in this case, I'm going to compare it to the, I'm going to compare this table to on time denorm. I'm going to say if these two are the same, then the test passes. And I do that for each of them. There are other tools, and I did it this way. And so this setup, not ideal, and I probably wouldn't do it this way again. I'd probably find a little bit more of an efficient way to do this. But there are unit testing uh, extensions for DBT that people have written. I didn't try them. And the reason being is what I really wanted to impart on this group is, OK, this wasn't built to this, but I wanted to show how, how vanilla of DBT can I use and still accomplish this task? Because it's, a, it's an exercise in problem solving. And so that's what I wanted to go through. And so you can do this. It's not always going to be perfect. It may even break some of the rules of DBT. But in the end, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have a testable system. And that's more important to me than following all the patterns. I can refactor this later, which will be great. But I already have the tests in place, so I know that I'm at my codes actually good. So I can refactor all day long knowing that my, to my, my tests are good. All right, so that's the seed function. OK, so now I've got my data set up. In fact, why don't we do this? Um, Let's see, I am going to go ahead. Uh, I probably should have tried this before. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and open up this test again, and let's just take a look at this.
Docker DVT test. Oops. Oh yeah. I didn't want to run that. Okay, so I'm going to go into the DBT project. I'm going to run DBT seed select tag 01 join OK. So what this is going to do is it's seeding my data. All right, so it created some seeds. It added data to carrier code. This is, or here's the file. Um, and here's, it got on time data. What else did we do? We got the on time data code data and we got the expected data. So let's go ahead and just take a look um, at that schema. It's here. Uh oh. Always a good time. All right, oops, where did it go? It seeded it. Oh, sorry about that. All right, there you go. So there's your seeded, there's your seeded data in on time data. So I've seeded this data. There's my test case. It's ready to rock. I'm ready to run the model and do my ETL. Okay, so the next step after seeding the data is I'm going to do dbt run. dbt run is the is the when portion. What dbt run is going to do. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm actually passing it a couple of things. So I have a DB name. I've parameterized the DB name. This will be dev. I have a schema that it's using. So this is the schema that I'm using within dbt. So I know that that's where it's going to be doing the, the ETL or ELT from. But what run is going to do is it's going to find the models that I want to run. And in this case, I only have one. So let's take a look at it. So I have a schema where I'm saying, I want you to create the on time denorm table. Here are the columns that are on that table. Okay, so this comes from my requirements. This was my mapping. It's going to validate that the columns exist. I actually, DBT gives you the ability with a whole bunch of tests right out of the box. And then this one, I'm just using the not null. So it's going to validate that after you run your data transformations, that if you run DBT test, it'll make sure that the not null constraint is, is satisfied. And so it's going to do that for the whole model. So you can see all the columns that I'm putting onto this table. Then the question is, is what is it going to run to generate this table? And there's a SQL file here that contains that. So it's the same SQL, but you can see here, I have parameterized database names and schema names, which come from that command line procedure uh, that I stated before. Right. So we're going to go ahead and we need to run that one. So we'll, what we'll do is we're going to find data in the on time denorm. So I'm actually just going to go. Hopefully I can beat it. OK, so you can see here this object doesn't exist yet on time denorm. Uh oh, what did I get for an error? Oh, I didn't set the I didn't set my parameters. I'm going to have to run this from the script again. My apologies. Um, so we'll come back to that because I'm going to run it. For, I'm going to run the whole script here in a second. I need to set I need to set the environment variables and stuff. So. OK, so the next step is going to be verify DBT test. DBT test, same thing. What I'm doing here, same as DBT run up until this point, except for it says test but I'm telling it which models. So I want to do the on-time denorm model. So I want, I'm going to verify the on-time denorm model on all of its tests, but I'm going to, this one is the part that kind of stinks that I am going to exclude all the other tests. Now there's got to be a better way to do this than excluding all the other tests, but this works for this scenario. And part of this is just because of how the data is modeled. So let's actually do something different. Let's actually just, um, I'm going to come out of here. I'm going to do a Docker. DBT test. Um, 
Okay, so we're gonna run, let's run the join okay test. Okay, so there it is, there's your given. It's executing the seed. And now it has created the table for the denorm table. And now it's run all the tests. Verified that it, that that equality test. Make sure that it that it matched the expected. And then these are validating that all of those not null constraints passed. So it's all of the other tests that need to be run as a part of this. It's running with every single test. So if I were to run the same exact thing. And instead of running just the 01 test, and I just did run all, which I set this run all one to run, go through each of the test scripts and then run them. It's going to go through and do the same thing. While this is running, I'm going to go ahead and, and move back to the presentation. But that's what DBT is doing. Now, it wasn't easy, but it does work. Now, with DBT, I can use Snowflake as well. So what do I do with Snowflake? Because I can't put Snowflake in Docker doesn't matter. It's the same thing. If you go back to that, I'm going to go ahead and think about it as an abstraction. I can just, instead of using Docker within Snowflake, I'll just change the schema. My schema will be configured. So I'll call it the unit test schema. I can have the same database name, but I'll just say, I'm just going to do all my tests in a different schema in Snowflake instead of my dev schema or my prod schema. I'm going to use it in my unit test schema or something like that. Uh, this is how we used to do it in Hadoop and Hive as well. All right, so let's do that. Let's do the actual TDD part. All right, something that should work because I actually tried it this time. This is something I actually tried. Here's here's the uh, we're running close on time, so I'm going to do this quickly. If a carrier, I'm going to do it only in DBT. If a carrier code is not matched, whoops, it sh its value should be NA. So instead of unknown, it should be NA. So we have to go through our test data. And we just need to make sure that the expected results are going to be NA when it doesn't match. So that's the join unknown. So we'll change this to NA. NA. And then, then the join combined is the other place where this would break. And all I have to do now is I'm going to go ahead and rerun all my unit tests. So I've said now I've changed the tests that I'm expecting that there'll be NA. And as we go through this, it's going to go ahead and fail. So while we're waiting for this to fail, let's watch the first one fail and then I'll go make the code fix. Moment of truth coming. Painful, painful, painful. And exciting. OK, so that passed. Great. Oh, shoot. That one, that one should have passed. Well, it's always good to pass. That should have passed. Should have. Let's go ahead and make the code change, though. So in DBT, I need to change. Let's go find the SQL. So here, I know that here is where I need to make that change. So I'm going to go ahead and make the change. This thing's taking its time today. So there we got that first failure. Okay, so we're good there. So we know that it's failing. Last test is going to fail as well. Good. Seated. Run. I'm just going to kill that for now. Let's just let's just make sure that my change has worked. So we saw that it failed, so that's good. So we'll run this because I don't want to want to leave some time to be able to people to ask some questions here. I don't know why it's being slow. Well, because I'm doing it live, that's why it's being slow. So what's what's interesting here is I'm making sure that I made that code change. I didn't break the first test. I shouldn't have broken the first test. That's great. It still passes. So I didn't break something that was previously working. Now, did I fix something that was previously broken is the next question, which was this test was broken after I made that test change. And so it's going to verify that right now.
And this, this is actually illustrating another thing that I really don't like about doing it this way in DBT, which is I want instant feedback. You saw how quickly I could do this in Python. The tests run in you know 30 milliseconds. This is taking way too long for me, um, which means that as a development process, I'm running, when I do TDD, I'm typically running my tests a couple of times an hour as I make changes, just to see how we're doing, making sure I'm not breaking other stuff. Yeah, this is taking, oh, it was finishing, it just didn't scroll. So it actually passed all the tests, that was my bad. Very cool. There you go, we just did a live feature update. Uh, we got one more test to finish and then it's done. Cool. All right, let's move on. Last, last couple of thoughts I wanna talk about, common issues. You know, you're not gonna have a Docker environment. So I discussed that a little bit. You've got a UI based DAG tool. You know, you may have to you may have to write some special code or a special framework to handle this. But a lot of tools like stream sets have API services, uh, or they might even have some sort of test framework that you might be able to use. They're more and more understanding that you need these things. Um, integrations with other tools that like great expectations or your test libraries like PyTest. Yeah, you can do them, but just understand that they're gonna take some time. You're not gonna do them overnight. They're gonna, it's gonna take some trial and error. Most tools aren't built to be able to do this. So you may have to get creative like we did and build it with Python or something like that. And then your test data is going to be very difficult to manage because we have way too many columns on our tables. You have way too many, you have a lot of different test scenarios. Um, and so there's infinite number of combinations. And so this data can be difficult to manage, but you can do it if you actually do good test scenario, test case planning. Now I'm going to cover, I just want to real quickly mention a couple of real success stories that I had. Currently, one of the ones that we're doing in Python, we were able to use this to be able to take our team from having monolithic hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lines of code that we could barely manage and know what was going on. This allows us to actually go to source control and get, have an automated testing process, know if things broke, broke or didn't, and then hook them into an automated deployment process. I had one, I had a retail example where we built this thing completely with test driven development and it allows us it allowed us it kept us from having support hours we only had about eight hours of support in a whole year and and as retail we were able to re redo the whole core of the etl pipeline and deployed in under a week right before black friday freeze nobody nobody would would take that chance but we felt confident because the amount of tests that we had what another thing that's extremely memorable for me is I learned R and Python using TDD and TDDE. And what I mean by this is I didn't know R, but I figured out how to write a test in R. And I could say, I expect my data frame to look like this when I'm done writing my code. And then once I figured out how to write the code in the test pass, I had learned in R how to do the transformation that I wanted to do. I thought that was fantastic. All right, whew, that was a mouthful. Uh, recap, TDD requires a lot of commitment and problem solving. It can be done but it doesn't always have an easy button. And lastly, one test is better than zero tests, and that's always. So if there are any questions, I know we don't have a ton of time, but I really hope that uh, I bombarded you with information that's gonna keep you thinking over the weekend. Uh, feel free to connect and reach out to me. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. But yeah, do we have any questions? Yeah, one question so far. It says, is, right. DD, is DBT only for SQL based code or can we test for other programming languages like Python or PySpark? Good question. I would definitely go read the DBT documentation, join the Slack community. It is a SQL based EL, ELT uh, framework. Um, I haven't looked to see if you can build any sort of custom functions and things in Python, but I think it's all SQL. Great question. Yeah, I think that's one of the challenging things, but it does have a here's what's cool. Uh, my next it, my next venture into this thing is that um, I would I would um, with with DBT being a Python based language and based library, it actually has libraries that you can uh, that you can call from Python. And so I would actually integrate DBT into my Python test framework. And then I might be able to have some functionality, but I don't know as a part of the actual DBT itself if you'd be able to do that. All right, that's all the questions I have. Okay. Well, good. Uh, well, maybe I'm, I'm guessing that everybody's hats and and uh, 
skin is is, is blown back from that fire hose information but it was fast it was furious you guys can maybe if it's recording play it back and uh put it in uh slow-mo that was good yep. yeah Paul, uh, this, this recording Digress. will be uh on improving's youtube channel early next week if anyone wants to watch this back nice cool Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks everybody. Have a great weekend and uh yeah, hopefully this was helpful to you.